Coming up on Garden Talk. It is definitely not the optimal way to grow. It's just a way to grow that is extremely simple. So if you are in a place where you have no energy access, where you can't have a pump, you can still grow things hydroponically using the Kratky method. It can be as complicated or as simple as you want. The simplest versions of these are extremely simple. I can guarantee most people have the stuff they need from a growing perspective in their house. If you use something like a normal miracle Grow that is a high urea fertilizer in hydroponics, the plants will die. When the plant gets the solution, it will uptake some things and release some things, and those things that the plant uptakes and release heavily affect the pH. Even though it seems very intimidating, it can be done, and you will be saving yourself like a lot of money. What's up everybody, if you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 79. In this episode, I interview Daniel Fernandez. He has been gardening for 20 years and runs the Science and Hydroponics YouTube channel. In this episode, he talks all about hydroponics. There's definitely some good information for beginners, such as the basics, but there's also a lot of advanced information included in this episode. For those of you that already have experience in hydroponics, but want to take your knowledge to the next level, thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to VivoSun for sponsoring this episode. VivoSun recently released the Smart Grow system. The Smart Grow system helps streamline the growing process by automating stage of growth requirements, on and off schedules, spectral range, airflow and circulation, and even records useful data about your environment. It is Wi-Fi capable and connects to the VivoSun app, so you can control your grow space from your smartphone. Check out their website at vivosun.com. I will provide a link in the YouTube description section below. AC Infinity is sponsoring this episode. Their clip-on oscillating fan is now released. I've been using their 6-inch version for over 6 months now, and I absolutely love it. It's easy to clip on the side of my grow tent, and it has 10 different speeds, which makes it easy to control air circulation. They do also have non-oscillating versions of these clip-on fans. These fans are currently in high demand. When they sell out of the fans, which I expect them to often, you can pre-order them for the next release. You can also use discount code MrGrowIt if you're buying off their website, acinfinity.com. That discount code works for all AC Infinity items. Or discount code MrGrowIt15 if you're buying off Amazon. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Daniel Fernandez from Science and Hydroponics. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, first of all. Really enjoyed your podcast, so this is a great opportunity for me to be able to uh, have this talk with you. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. When you reached out to me through DMs, like I mentioned before, we, we hit the record button here. Uh, I noticed you from the uh, Cultivation Certificate Program at Utah State University with Dr. Bruce Bugby. And I actually attended that and I saw you, you have a couple videos through that program. And I recognized your name right away through Instagram. And I was like, yes, he wants to come on. So I know you have extensive knowledge when it comes to hydroponics. I mean, you have a whole YouTube channel based around it. And uh, that's what really what we're gonna get into today. Talk all about hydroponics. We're gonna get into some stuff for beginners, but we're also getting into some more advanced knowledge stuff for those folks that have the experience that wanna get to the next level. So I think this is gonna appeal to a wide audience. But first, what I like to do with all the guests is an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Uh, yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, my name is Daniel Fernandez. I got into gardening around 20 years ago when I was 15. You know, I had a big space that I could grow things in. And then a friend told me that we should try hydroponics. So we actually started growing tomatoes there. And at the time, that was right before I started studying chemistry. So I did my undergrad in chemistry while I learned hydroponics. And then I went and did a PhD in Spain. Um, and I've been working in hydroponics ever since. So I've been working uh, in my own growth 20 years. And then I've been working with people as a consultant for the past more or less 12 years. 
Awesome. So let's start with a basic question, super basic for the beginners. What is hydroponics and what are some of the hydroponic systems out there? So that is an interesting question and it's, it's not as straightforward, like there are a lot of definitions out there. I like to think about hydroponics as any crop where you have no soil in it. So for me, anytime where you're growing plants and there is no soil that contains the nutrition that the plants need, then that to me is a hydroponic crop. In the scientific community, it will be more formally defined as a crop where you have only water, so where you have no media to support plants, while the grows where you have media supporting the plants, for example, when you grow in cocoa or in rock wool, those are more referred to as soilless culture. I like to think about all of those as hydroponics. And I mean, that's to me, it's the science of growing plants without soil, like hydroponic culture. Uh, regarding the types of systems that you have. So <clears throat> depending on the type of plant that you have, you have access to different systems. The most basic systems that we have are basically a plant with its roots sitting in water, where you have all the things that we, what we call deep water culture and what we call Kratky systems. And you then have si these usually caters to plants that are smaller um, normally. You have then systems for bigger plants that you can have things like Dutch buckets where you have large amounts of media there, or you can even have bigger plants in what we call, like they, there are industrial systems to do this type of thing uh, where we have channels. You know, if somebody has ever seen a hydroponic crop where you have these huge gutters that are normally made of plastic, and then you have plants grown on them, and uh, these plants, these systems are usually what we call nutrient flow technique systems, NFT systems. And we also have DFT systems, um, which are deep uh, flow technique systems. So all of these systems can be used to, to grow plants. You mentioned the crack key method, and that's a method that has been around for a very long time. A lot of people use it. We haven't yet talked about it on this podcast. Can you explain what is the Kratky method and how does that work? So the Kratky method is was created by Dr. Kratky in Hawaii. So around the 20 years ago, more or less, are the first papers about it. And then you have papers up until like the mid-2010s, I believe. And the idea here is basically to grow a plant with no energy input. What happens is that when you have something like a plant that is sitting on water, that the roots are in the water, the water needs to contain oxygen for the roots to uptake nutrients. If the water runs out of oxygen, then the roots will die normally. So what happens in a um, Kratky system is that we want to be able to grow without having to introduce that oxygen because in a normal deep water culture system, you'll need to constantly pump air to keep that oxygen high enough. Well, in the Kratky method, we say we don't even need that. What we're going to do is that simply we're gonna add all the water that the plant needs for its entire life. And then we're gonna let the roots drain that water so the plant will transpire that water. And by reducing the level of the water, the roots that get exposed to the air will actually be able to absorb oxygen and use that oxygen transported to the roots that are actually submerged in the water to get nutrients. So in this way, you can grow basically any plant provided you can put all the water that's ever gonna be needed in the initial reservoir. So this sort of method is sort of limited to plants that are small because you can imagine that a tomato plant might use, I don't know, 100 gallons of water through its lifetime. So it might be difficult for you to create a tall 100 gallon container and then have it empty while a lettuce plant might use a tenth of that or even less. So it, it might use very little water, which allows you to basically put the plant inside of a, the plant in a bucket where the roots are growing into the water and then they transpire the water. The water level is dropping, is dropping, is dropping. It allows oxygen to be transported and the plant does not die. Uh, it is a low yielding method. Yields in Kratky are obviously lower because the plant is under like a suboptimal condition the entire time. 
trying to stay alive. But you can grow healthy plants, you can grow leafy greens, you can even grow tomatoes if you like are willing to replenish solution and introduce a little bit of labor into it. But it is definitely not the optimal way to grow, it's just a way to grow that is extremely simple. So if you are in a place where you have no energy access, where you can have a pump, you can still grow things hydroponically using the Kratky method. That's interesting. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people having success with that method and like they, they said the same thing you did is it's a, a simple method, uh, but I personally haven't tried that method yet. So yeah, really interesting to hear. I know there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they hear about hydroponics talking about a whole system that needs to be purchased. Some people are spending hundreds of dollars on systems, but really you don't have to spend that much. You can do a DIY, you can actually build it yourself. Some people have the materials just lying around their house or in their garage, for example. Can you talk to us about how to create a basic DIY hydroponic system? Okay, so it depends fundamentally on the level of complexity. All you need in reality is a container that you can put a plant in with water in it. So think about a Kratky setup. In a Kratky setup, you can use a mason jar to build a Kratky setup, or you can use any sort of container where you can place the plant and then have the water inside the container. There is no need for any sort of uh, high tech stuff. Just a container is enough for starting. Of course, what do you want to achieve with your growing system? Do you just want to grow a plant and see it grow and you don't care too much about learning about what's going on and your priorities are to have less, uh, to, to spend less time growing the plant. If that's your priority, then a Kratky system is going to be a, a great introduction and something that you can do basically set and forget type of thing. Uh, however, if you're, interesting, if you're interested in growing uh, and learning more about hydroponics, then a deep water culture system is close to the exact same thing, just with an air pump in, just with an air stone and an air pump. And the issue is that because a uh, deep water culture system is way more efficient, the plant will gather way more nutrition from it and therefore the chemistry will be affected significantly more. So you will need to do things like pH monitoring, EC monitoring, adjust the level of the solution, all these sorts of things that a Kratky setup doesn't have to deal with because it's less efficient, a less efficient growing method. Anybody can do a deep water culture system with like minimal investment for like a couple of plants or something like that. You can also go more into it and then there are a bunch of alternatives that are midway between buying something fully made and uh, building it yourself from like complete scratch. For example, to build an NFT system, maybe you don't want to like cut the plastic gutters yourself you can just buy the the gutters already pre-made and then do the rest yourself. It can be as complicated or as simple as you want. The simplest versions of these are extremely simple. I can guarantee most people have the stuff they need from a growing perspective in their house, not counting the fertilizer, but just the containers and stuff. Um, and then you can make it as more advanced as, as you want. And you know, you could even go, even some DIY people have gone into like fully automated hydroponic systems where you have peristaltic pumps doing all the nutrient dosing and the pH adjusting and you have environmental control. And I mean, DIY in hydroponics goes as simple or as crazy as you want it to go, depending on your level of interest, the amount of time that you have and well, what your goals are. Yeah, I have a buddy who actually, he just grows one plant and he took a five gallon bucket with a lid, cut a hole in the top, dropped a net pot in there, uh, had his air stones fed into there, and that's pretty much it. Of course, you have the hydro ton pellets in the net pot and stuff like that, but like that's all he does. You know, he, he monitors his water level, there's some maintenance, but very, very basic, something you can do on your own with very minimal money. So I wanna make that well known to the folks that are beginners that maybe feel overwhelmed listening to this uh, because it can be that simple. There are, there are several videos on my channel about a system that I built using a, a, what was it, like a four gallon bucket, a five gallon bucket with a net pot and a lid. And it was a Kratky system. It didn't have a pot. It didn't have, I, I did monitor the pH and the EC 24 seven because part of the objective was to log it, but I could have not done that. So it, it is definitely can be extremely simple. Absolutely. 
Let's get into the fertilizer side of things here. So what fertilizers can be used and then what fertilizers can't be used in hydroponics? So that's a very interesting question and a question that comes up very frequently. They're the fertilizers that most people are used to are the fertilizers that are used for soil. Soil has a big advantage to it and it's that it has a lot of microbes that can process things into other things. Uh, most importantly, you have urea that is a very, very common commodity fertilizer because it's practically the cheapest form of nitrogen you can get, of reduced nitrogen. And then you can use that in soil because there are bacteria there that can convert that urea into nitrate, which is a form of nitrogen that plants do best with. Now, in hydroponics, there are usually no such bacterial, po bacterial populations. So if you use something like a normal miracle Grow that is a high urea fertilizer in hydroponics, the plants will die because they will not get any nitrate from it. The pH will acidify extremely fast whenever that urea is decomposed to ammonium. So basically, if you're thinking about soil fertilizers, especially the nitrogen containing soil fertilizers, all those cannot be used in hydroponics. There are also a lot of things that are insoluble that are used in soil. We have a lot of fertilizers like rock phosphates, like uh, maybe we have composts, we have things that are good for soil because the microbes can break it down, but in a hydroponic setup, they would just sit there and there would, they wouldn't dissolve at all. So we definitely don't want to be using anything that is insoluble or that is the wrong chemical form. There are a bunch of things that are shared between both worlds. For example, calcium nitrate, which is a super common fertilizer used to green out uh, yards, like front yards, uh, green up incredibly easily when you apply calcium nitrate to it. So that's a fertilizer that is sort of used in those situations as well. And then it is also very commonly used in fertilizers because in the end, everything you use in hydroponics, you could use in soil, but not the other way around. So anything that is hydroponic, that is a hydroponic fertilizer is going to be uh, usable in a soil environment, but the other way around is not the case. So if you want to buy a fertilizer for hydroponics, then you need to ensure that it is formulated for hydroponic growing. If you are not familiar with the chemistry of how all this happens. Got it. And I know you're actually a proponent of making your own nutrients. Can you talk to us about how to make your own nutrients for hydroponic systems? Yeah, so when I talk about making your own nutrients, I refer to using... So most of the fertilizers that you can buy that are for hydroponics are blends of raw fertilizer inputs. So what I mean when I say make your own fertilizer is instead of buying these boutique blends for hydroponics, you can actually make your own from these raw fertilizer inputs. So I created a program that's called HydroBody that I created 13 years ago in 2009 that basically helps you formulate your own fertilizers using these raw inputs. So chemistry can be extremely, um, extremely intimidating to a lot of people. And so I understand that this is not very easy to do, uh, but there are like some baby steps that can be involved here. For example, instead of having to make a complete fertilizer with all the elements that are required for a plant to survive from scratch, from all the different raw fertilizer inputs, you can actually start by going into, for example, a fertilizer like a 51126, for example, like a master blend or a Peters 51126, which has already most of the things blended in ratios that are adequate, and then you just make the calcium nitrate and the, um, let's say, monopotassium phosphate or some of these other fertilizers. So sort of a midpoint between these two things. And then from there, you know, you can move into making your own concentrated solutions so that you can then uh, prepare your own fertilizers uh, at, your, at your house or at your grow or anything like this. Um, or you can also move instead of making your nutrient solution you can also move perhaps it's less intimidating to then start making your own amendments so there are things for example like uh, calmax 
that you can make yourself. CalMax are fertilizers that use calcium magnesium salts that I have a video so I have a video about making a CalMac and you use um, calcium nitrate, calcium acetate, salts of this sort. You blend them and you create you create a solution with them and then that's your CalMac. And I know I'm talking about all, it's very hard to talk about uh, such a complicated topic in such a short amount of time. But if you go to my website or if you look at my YouTube channel, I have a lot of videos about how to actually make your own fertilizers, where I talk about the chemistry of how to do this properly, what inputs to use, which sorts of formulations to make. Uh, it's an entire world. But what I want people to take from this is that even though it seems very intimidating, it can be done and you will be saving yourself like a lot of money because the markup in these hydroponic fertilizers, the markups are insane. Like the margins that fertilizer manufacturers make are very, very large. And especially the ones that are selling you fertilizers that are specialized for certain plants, those will be usually the most, most expensive. Because like definitely Peters or Master Blend, they are, aren't making like a lot of margin on their 511, 26 or these sorts of blends that they make that are for like the large scale horticultural industry. I was going to say there must be a significant cost savings and you answered that. Yeah, there is. I mean, if you spend the time to do the research to learn how to do it, you know, going to your website or YouTube channel or whatever and, and learning how to formulate your own nutrients in the long run, it'll definitely save you. So yeah, thanks for sharing that with us today. The cost savings, just to go a little bit deeper into that, the cost savings are normally for a single person making this. Um, they can be, it, it can be even a hundred times cheaper if you're willing to buy a large enough quantity of things. Wow, that's incredible. So I have to ask about organic growing and hydroponics. Some people say it's not possible. There's some people that say it is possible. <laughs> Talk to us about organic growing and hydroponics. Is it actually possible or not? It depends on how you define it. So if we define hydro, if we define organic growing as the agricultural practice that grows the soil, then it is impossible because by definition, hydroponics does not include any soil. So if we start with that definition, then the answer is that it can't be done. However, if we go for a more um, holistic definition where we do not say soil must be involved, but let's say no um, processed fertilizers can be used, no um, like uh, synthetic fertilizers can be used. So we go into a world where can we grow in a hydroponic setup using only the raw inputs that would be allowed in a soil hydroponic crop? In a so sorry, in a soil uh, organic crop. So could we do that? Uh, the answer is that we can. We can uh, do it. Like I've worked, I've been working with several uh, large-scale facilities growing leafy greens organically, and we have achieved it. And you can look at that in my Instagram, and you can see pictures where we we're growing uh, plants in fully organic solutions in a hydroponic environment where we are even beating the yields of the conventional hydroponic setups that are right next to them. So it can be done uh, and it can be done very successfully. Now it is tricky because a lot of the, as I mentioned, there are things like the nitrogen cycle that does not exist in a hydroponic setup. So we need to uh, separate things a little bit. And what we do need to do is a lot of pre-processing of the solutions, right? So while you would mix, for example, I don't know your, your uh, for example, corn steep liquor is a very common uh, source of phosphorus in organic growing because it's very high phosphorus. It contains a lot of lactic acid, for example. Uh, if you used it in hydroponics as is, it wouldn't work well because that amount of lactic acid would be toxic to the plants. So we need to pre-ferment that in a tank with adequate bacteria to get all those organic acids to be used and turned into CO2 and we eliminate it and that way we can create uh, fertilizers that can be used in, in a hydroponic setup. Now at a large scale we do this at the large scale facilities, right? But there are already companies that are producing these like pre-fermented inputs 
that you can use. Um, there is a, a company that is I'm not affiliated with, which is called Agrihusta, which has like potassium nitrate equivalent solutions, calcium nitrate equivalent solutions that are all OMRI registered and that are derived fully from organic inputs and they are just processed so that all these available forms of nutrition are already there so that they don't need to be generated right there. So yeah, if we define organics as growing plants using only OMRI approved inputs, then we can, we can do it. And we can do it with like, we need actually active bacterial populations to be able to achieve these with, without a problem. Now, what about microbial inoculants? See, I mean, you touched upon microbes earlier in this episode, and uh, you mentioned that there's really no exchange happening as far as the conversion of elements in hydroponics. Are microbial inoculants useless when growing hydroponically, or are they useful in some ways? They are. So, yeah, this is super controversial because the evidence is all over the place. If you look at the scientific evidence of micro inoculation in hydroponics, you'll find anything. So I think that the answer is if you're perfect, the benefits from them are going to be very limited because if your growing conditions are absolutely perfect, the microbes are very little to contribute because everything is already perfect. If you are not perfect, then they might give you some breathing room if you screw up. So they can help you if your growing conditions are not perfect, if there's stress going on, there might be mechanisms by which they can protect you. Not all hydroponic systems are suitable for microbes. If you have a deep water culture system and you add microbes to it, it will be super dirty. Uh, and if the solution does not cater to those microbes, then those microbes will likely become, a, or they will encourage pathogenic microbes then getting in there. So you need to, if you are going to have microbes, then the solution needs to cater to them as well. And the media also needs to cater to them. So it is a decision that needs to be made. Like, is it going to have microbes or is it not going to have microbes? Uh, if it is going to have microbes, then design everything around that. If it's not going to, then uh, design it so that it's not going to. It is also easier to have microbes in hydroponic systems where the solutions are not recirculated. For example, if you have a drain to waste setup where you are just irrigating a plant in a soilless medium, then inserting microbes there is far easier than if you recirculated the solution because the microbes are just going to be there with the plant. They're not going to be in your drip lines, they're not going to be in your tanks, they're not going to be anywhere else. So usually, if you are going to introduce microbes in a system like that, usually you're not going to have a problem when you do that. So I consider them useful. Like uh, another point is that microbes can also help you with pathogens. There are microbes that are not for the plant, but for fighting pathogens. So while they might not help you with the uptake of nutrients for the plant, just the fact that they're filling an ecological niche in the root zone will mean that something else that's pathogenic will not be able to fill it. So furthermore, there are some microbes that will actively fight uh, things that are there. For example, if you have, um, let's say, root aphids and you, have, you inoculate your media with um, Bavaria vasiana or with other microbes that are pathogenic to root aphids, then they will fight the root aphids when they get there. So microbes are insurance in my view. They are something that we do not need to grow perfect. If we can grow perfectly, if you are not perfect, then I think that it's not going to hurt you if you add them and you have designed your system so that adding them is beneficial. I agree when you said it was a controversial topic because I get a yeah. lot of people that are arguing both ways. And so uh, thanks for bringing some clarity on that avenue. I wanna switch it up. I want to get into Silica next. Talk to us about silicon and, and silicates in hydroponics. Okay, so silicon is not an element that's necessary for plant life, uh, at least for many uh, plants. Like there are some plants like grasses that require silicon, but for plants like tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, lettuce, you don't really need silicon for them to live. We have found through research that it is beneficial. Uh, there's a lot of research in the scientific community showing that if you can get silicon into a plant, 
then it will, at, at the very, very least, protect it from uh, fungal pathogens. Like that, we have so much evidence for that we already take that as fact. Um, but how do you get it into the plants? The problem is that the chemistry of silicon is tricky. Uh, most of the silicates that we have, most of the minerals that contain silicon are not soluble. They are just not going to dissolve in water. So how do we get silicon in the water? So we have these products that are called, uh, we have these types of minerals called silicates. And some of these silicates like calcium silicate, potassium silicate and sodium silicate are soluble in water at really high pH. So if you have a pH of above 11, then all of these will be soluble. Then, as soon as you, you can create a concentrated solution of these silicates, they're dissolved in water. Then you can add a little bit of that to a solution, to a hydroponic solution. And at the pH that you have in hydroponics, between 5.5 and 6.5, let's say, all that silicate will be transformed into silicic acid, which is a form that is available to plants for their optic. There is, There are some hypotheses that other slightly larger forms of silicon are also available to plants. Very difficult to test it. The issue is that these silicic acids, these monosilicic acids, are extremely unstable and their pH uh, between, in their pHs between 4 and 8, they are extremely unstable. So they will quickly polymerize and be unavailable for the plant. So that's the main issue with this chemistry. Now, there are some products that will, give, will not give you silicates, the basic solutions, but they will give you monosilicic acids, stabilized monosilicic acids, which can exist in a stable form at a pH below 2. So if you have these silicic acid with molecules that can stabilize its structure at a pH below 2, then it will not polymerize because this polymerization forms quartz like uh, <clears throat> silicon dioxide, which is insoluble, or a silica gel, basically. So you can have those these two extremes. Now, when those stabilized silicic acids get put into a hydroponic solution at a pH of 5.8 or 5.5265, 5, the question is, are they polymerizing as well or are they not? So far, very few people have studied this. However, we know that there are some differences in availability of some of these stabilized silicic acids. There are several, I mean, probably a handful of studies right now that are showing that it is different um, than monosilicic acid derived just from silicates that, whose pH has been dropped to the pH in hydroponics. So which is better uh, for root uptake? We don't know. There is also the question of foliar feeding of silicon. If you feed silicon through the leaves and not through the roots, then you need to consider that silicon is completely immobile. Once it is mobilized inside a plant and placed somewhere, it will not move. So this means you need to routinely apply it because tissue that grows after you do the foliar will never get the silicon that you applied before. Is it better to apply one form or the other? Right now it is uh, unknown. It is unknown. Evidence is pointing to the fact that it is not exactly the same, but uh, a silicic acid's ability, like a stabilized silicic acid's properties, will depend heavily on what it was stabilized for and how that was uh, achieved. There are may there are maybe like thirty ways to achieve that. So it is uh, when things are marketed as monosilicic acids. Just bear in mind that what sort of stabilized monosilicic acid. When mixing silica into a reservoir, it's generally recommended to mix that in first and then mix in your other nutrients. Can you talk to us about why that is and then also what order nutrients should be mixed into your reservoir? Yeah, so normally you will mix the silicates first because silicates are more stable in dilute solutions. If they encounter a solution that has more things in it, more cations and more anions, it is bound to be less stable and polymerize faster. So you add it first because the least amount of things that your solution is ever going to have will be the f when it's like our water or tap water when it's when it has when you have added nothing else. So you add the silicon to that and when you add the silicon the pH will be higher and it will be a little bit more stable. Normally you will inject silicon first, then you will inject whatever is more acidic, uh, which is normally a solution containing acidic potassium phosphates of some sort. 
uh, which is mi normally micros and potassium, so uh, monopotassium phosphate or things like this. So silicate, then this acidic solution, then the nitrates usually go, or the calcium containing solutions. And then finally, you will set the pH with an acid uh, to the final pH that you want. That is normally a way that works well. It is not the only way. Like you could also, for example, do add the silicon, then uh, set the pH, then add the other things, then set the pH again. Although that is not very effective in terms of the, like the amount of control that you require. So this is the standard. What I've mentioned is usually the standard. It is also very common to put a mixing chamber right after the silicon, especially if you're using an injector system, because the silicates, if they are not fully mixed into the solution, then they can precipitate when the next injector injects things into the line. If you are mixing into a large reservoir by hand, then you need to ensure that that's properly mixed before adding the, the other uh, nutrients to your solution. Gotcha. Okay. Another controversial one I wanted to touch base on is uh, gypsum. So here people add in gypsum into their hydroponic systems. And uh, there's others that say you shouldn't do that because it's not soluble. Give us a lowdown on gypsum, calcium sulfate in hydroponics. I have an entire video on just this like precise topic of gypsum in hydroponics. Uh, gypsum is not as soluble as many things. It's not calcium nitrate, but it is very soluble. Like it is, I mean, it is not as insoluble as many other things. It is not a rock phosphate. It is way more soluble than that. So it is definitely not soluble enough for you to prepare a concentrated solution of gypsum to use in your hydroponic setup that will not work. But you can get 400 ppm of calcium from gypsum, like from gypsum. I mean, it is soluble enough that you could dissolve enough to supply more than double the nutrient requirement of the highest calcium requiring plant in a hydroponic solution. However, you would need to add it directly to the, to the final nutrient solution. You cannot, as I mentioned, prepare a concentrated solution and then add it. You will need to add it to the final solution. And then you have one thing and it's that the kinetics of the solution of the gypsum are slow. So it will take time for it to dissolve. It will take time in the order of maybe hours for it to properly dissolve in a solution. Another thing that gypsum has that is quite tricky is that its solubility goes down as temperature increases. So you need to mix it at pretty low temperature. So if you have a solution that's above 70 Fahrenheit, then gypsum is gonna be less soluble than all the solubility that it could have. So yeah, it can be used so under precise conditions. Okay, getting a little bit deeper into water temperature. What is the optimal water temperature when growing hydroponically? So in most cases, I would say that around um, 70 Fahrenheit is the optimal temperature for roots in general. You can grow at a little bit higher temperature and that can be optimal for some plants under some conditions. But then we start getting into the point, you know, oxygen solubility goes down as the temperature goes up. So if it's a system that has issues with its oxygenation, then that's not gonna help it at all. For example, if you have a media that retains too much water between irrigations, that's not gonna help at all. So normally if you're at 70, that's perfect. If you're at 75, plants can most plants can tolerate that. If you're at 80, then you're gonna have low oxygen and fungal and bacterial issues because especially anaerobic bacteria uh, will love solutions that are low in oxygen and high in temperature. To the low side, then when you go to 65, you might still be able to do fine, but the problem is that the kinetics of nutrient transport becomes lower as the temperature drops, so the uptake of nutrients becomes more sluggish. So you start having issues with the uptake of some things, and then when you drop below 65, phosphorus uptake drops to basically zero because it does require substantial, I mean, it does require the temperature for the uptake because of these kinetics of uptake. So if you drop the temperature below 65, you start noticing that your plants will basically turn purple um, because, of, because of that, which some people use to their advantage. 
yeah, the water temperature is one of my biggest concerns. Uh, yeah, I live in a desert region, and I think right now it's at, uh, okay, in this room right here, it's at 81 degrees Fahrenheit. I turned off the AC for recording, blah, blah, blah. Usually it's about 78, but the water temperature, what I heard is, is over 75 is really, you're at risk of those pathogens happening, right? And so uh, I've just avoided DWC, you know, hydroponics in general because of that reason why. But I know there are hacks around it. Some people add in like frozen water bottles into the reservoir to lower the temperature. Some people buy a chiller to add to reduce the water temperature. So there are solutions for controlling it. But I mean, if you're adding in a chiller, you're, you have to consume more energy right? And then do a cost analysis, see if it's worth it or not. So that's just one of my biggest things that I've avoided hydroponic growing for is, is water temperature alone. So just, just to tie to the previous topic, one of the things that mainly limits crab key usage is water temperature, because if the water gets hot, then it's not going to work at all. So that's a main limiting factor. Uh, as you say, normally plants tolerate warmer air way better than warmer water, because warm air still contains um, 20% oxygen. So plants will do much, I mean, if you're growing in a hot region, it is much better to do something like um, uh, Dutch buckets or a system that is like a drain to waste system with cocoa, because that way you can very easily control the temperature. Even if your plants get hot water for like water at 85 for uh, a few minutes or 30 minutes while you irrigate them, they will still get the air soon after. So it's way, way less uh, trolling. Okay, that's good to know. pH, super important when it comes to hydroponics. What pH is optimal for hydroponics and then stabilizing pH? Can you get into that a little bit? Because that's tricky for some people. So the optimal pH in hydroponics for plants, for most higher plants, is going to be let's say between 5.8 and 6.2, like if you want to be narrow, but plants can do well between 5.5 and 6.5. That's really the region that they do fine in. Um, it is very important to keep them in that region because when you go to the lower end, you start getting very high uptake of some nutrients, micronutrient uptake becomes way too high below 5.5 and also sulfur uptake becomes way too low and then to the upside, then you get issues with micro uptake becoming too low. So that's like the main thing that happens is that your micro uptake just plummets, especially iron uptake at high pH is super, super low. So that's why you need to take care of your, of your pH. Now, how do you make it stable? There are two things that change your pH. One is chemistry. So the chemicals that are actually in there when you prepare the solution. But the most important thing that changes your pH is how the plant modifies the solution when it gets it. So when the plant gets the solution, it will uptake some things and release some things. And those things that the plant uptakes and release heavily affect the pH. And the best way to stabilize the pH of a solution and the media is to make sure that the ratio of the things that the plant uptakes causes as little of a shift in the pH as possible. This normally means that you'll need to play with your ammonium to nitrate ratio. So plants will generally uptake a lot of nitrate and push the pH up under normal circumstances. Most plants will do that. They, when they're especially in vegging phases, they will push the pH up due to nitrate uptake. So if you add some ammonium, that ammonium is uptaken really fast and it counterbalances that so that the plant does not modify the pH much. Trying to stabilize the pH of the solution itself is very problematic if you are not also catering to the chemistry that the plant wants to uptake. Because if you just try to add buffers or add stuff to like force the solution to a pH, the, the, and you feed things that the plant will uptake very drastically and dramatically affect the pH, then it's gonna be a losing game. Like the best solution that you have to control the pH is to make sure that the nutrients that you're feeding are actually a, buffering the nutrient uptake of the plant. Now, you can uh, buffer this nutrient uptake through this, but there are other plants, for example, you have tomatoes that uptake massive amounts of potassium and will heavily acidify the solution at some points. Then in those cases, uh, you might want to use, uh, add more nitrate, for example, to counterbalance that, that uh, extreme uptake of potassium. 
So there, there are a bunch of uh, strategies you can use in terms of the nutrient uptake, but you need to consider the plant. Like just chemically adjusting the solution does not work that well. However, when you adjust the solution, you can also consider the uptake when you adjust it. For example, a very common strategy is that when the pH increases, you add nitric acid with ammonium in it so that you both replenish the nitrogen but you are also increasing the ammonium to nitrate ratio so that so that every time you adjust the probability of adjusting is lowered because you are shifting things a little bit every time you adjust so that sort of like smart adjustment of the ph uh, works better than um doing just adjustments with regular acids or bases and you'll notice that companies will often sell pH ups and pH downs that consider that take these into consideration. Like pH ups are not just potassium hydroxide and pH downs are not just monopotassium phosphate. They often include, or phosphoric acid, they include other things to help you buffer nutrient uptake. Okay, so basically you're saying most of the causes are due to the fertilizer not being balanced for that plant. So if somebody, generally speaking, if somebody is growing hydroponically and they continue to struggle with that stable pH, they may want to consider going to a different fertilizer? Yeah, they might consider changing the ratio of certain things in your fertilizer. Okay. And so that they need to fight that less. However, there's also the case that some plants will be will grow way better in a way that is very destabilizing to the pH. So that is also a counter to this. Like if you are going to be growing a plant at its maximum potential, maybe your pH will never be stable. You, you sometimes need to compromise that. You can also, for example, let's say if you're using a drain to waste setup and you're irrigating with um, a pH of six and then your runoff is always like six, five, seven. You can then water at lower pH, like at 5.5, five, to like compensate that change so that your runoff does not shift that much and it's in the zone that you want it to be. So you can also play with the... Because what, in, what matters is the pH of the root zone. So in systems where you are watering and then that solution is not recirculated, uh, you need to consider that you are blind to the pH of the root zone and the pH of the input is not as important as the pH of the root zone that you're growing. Got it. I did actually watch your video on runoff and, and pH. Really, really good video. I totally recommend it for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. Definitely check it out. A lot of good information. You clarify a lot of things in that video. Next up, I want to get into EC or PPM. What's the optimal range for hydroponics? So this is an interesting question because different ions conduct electricity differently. And therefore, the EC of two solutions with different composition, uh, they won't be... They, they're, they won't be chemically equivalent at the same EC. So what I'm saying is that while you might be at a certain EC that works well for a given nutrient composition, then if you have a nutrient composition that is substantially different, then that same EC will not be equivalent. So this is why talking in terms of EC is a little bit misleading because then to, a person might say, hey, I grow at an EC of 1.5 and it works great. And another person might say, well, I grow at two, and then the solutions are very different. And then when you look at what the actual osmotic pressure of the solutions is, they might be the same at 1.5 and at two. So it is, it, it is not a good practice, and I know why it's so common, but I think it would be, um, it is more uh, useful if people only do easy comparisons when they're talking about like the same nutrients, right? Otherwise, I prefer to think instead of DC, what are the optimal nutrient ratios in hydroponics? Like what are the optimal nutrients to grow in? And that we can have a deeper conversation about and like that goes into like the formulations that are better for each plant according to the tissue that each plant is growing, you know? Because like it's not the same to grow a head of lettuce than it is to grow a tomato because in one case we're growing fruits and in the other case we're growing leaves. So what tissue are you growing and then your nutrients need to cater to whatever tissue you want to be grown. Yeah, I was going to say that the type of plant would certainly have an impact on it as well. All right, one more controversial topic for you and uh, I know people are going to love this one. Flushing. Is there any science behind flushing, uh, particularly medicinal plants, prior to harvest when growing in hydroponics? 
or actually growing in general? <laughs> so um, the question is, do you, is there a need to flush? Like, is there, should we always flush? Does flushing accomplish anything? So flushing really does not take anything out of the plant. The conception that, the, like the concept and this idea that the plant will lose nutrients because you flush is completely false. Like the plant will not lose any nutrients it already has taken up due to flushing. So that won't happen. What you will do is that you will completely, um, you will reduce the concentration of nutrients in the root zone. So do you need to do that? Because if you're growing at very high EC values in the root zone, maybe lowering the EC will give the plant some breathing room and it will be able to grow better for, let's say, that ending period. But are you growing at like the same stable EC nutrient concentration the entire time? And then if you flush, then you're gonna deprive it of those nutrients in the end. Do you want to deprive it of those nutrients? Uh, I don't see why you would. Like you are going to be wasting some of the most efficient, like the ending part of the growing cycle is the part where you get the most yield because it's where you have the most structure to build into. So um, it depends. Can you benefit from it? If you can benefit from it, then you should use it. If you cannot benefit from it because your conditions do not allow you to benefit from it, then you shouldn't because there is that, that's why there is a big disconnect sometimes when uh, you talk about people who uh, like uh, plant scientists who grow the plants perfectly and then they say, well, I flush and it's absolutely no benefit to me. I see a detriment and it's like, yeah, well, because you're growing this way. Uh, but if you grew this way where you have all these much higher EC in the media, then you would see a benefit. So whether you see a benefit or not depends on whether you need it or not. So uh, it is definitely not something that should be considered as a should always be done. It should be done when it's necessary. That makes sense. So taking a step back and taking a look at the folks that are new to hydroponics, what advice do you have for those that are new? So for people who are new to hydroponics, I would say you can start very at a very simple level. Hydroponics is a great way to grow plants. You have a lot of control. That is both a blessing and a curse because then you need to realize that you are very likely to fail uh, because you have all the power. So in soil, there are a lot of mechanisms that are working in your favor without you doing anything. In hydroponics, you have total control, which means you have total responsibility over the fate of the plant. And it's very likely that you will kill several plants. And that's not a bad thing. I think all of us who have ever grown plants have probably a lot of those plant carcasses in our closets. So it, it is not anything to be afraid of. And you can try small systems. I would say start small. Um, depending on your region, I would say you can, if you are in a cool, cooler region where your temperatures are fine, you can track Radke method or if it's a small indoor thing. If you want to grow at outdoors, then you might want to try a soilless media type of thing like a cocoa grow or something like that where you have um, a little bit less concern over the temperature of the water and things like this. But don't be afraid of it. I think that's the main thing. Don't be afraid of it. It can be done simply and can be done in a very complicated manner. Uh, there are nutrients that are very low cost that you can use. Just go ahead and try. I like asking that question towards the end of the episode because it gives the guest a chance to speak on something they didn't speak on the episode and also provides a ton of tips. Like everybody who asked that question to just provide so much good information, you know, specifically for beginners because a lot of the audience, a lot of them tuning in right now are beginners. They're just getting started. Maybe they're in a state that just legalized, for example, a, a certain plant that they can grow and now they're starting to grow. So um, having that advice for beginners, it's super valuable to a lot of people. So thanks for sharing that. Another question I asked towards the end is uh, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Also, I have my website, scienceinghydroponics.com, where I talk about the science of growing plants without soil, and I try to go into the scientific literature, and I try to address topics in a manner that is more evidence-based than other sources. I also have my YouTube channel, 
and science in hydroponics as well and I also have my Instagram with the same name and you can find me in all of these places um, I do gen I do consulting for small to large hydroponic growers I am one of the only consultants that you can get on the hour <laughs> because most of the large scale hydroponic consultants would never consult with you without like a, a like consulting contract I've kept my hourly consulting basically to allow people who have um, to allow the little guy a chance to like uh, benefit from my experience and also the experience of other consultants and growers I work with so that um, the consulting is not monopolized by, by the big guys. That's really cool that you offer consulting like that. Not a lot of people do and there are a lot of people out there that need help. And so uh, it's really, really awesome that you're there as a source. I'll definitely have a link to your YouTube channel down in the description section below. If you're tuning in on one of the podcast platforms, just search for them. You'll find them. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode, and I would love for you to tune into future episodes. Daniel, thanks so much for coming on to this episode today. This has been awesome. So much great information. I definitely learned a ton. This is one of the episodes where I'm going to watch back several times probably to grasp all that information. And uh, and then, yeah, hope we keep in touch and maybe you can come back for a part two sometime in the future. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. This was great. As I mentioned, I'm a big fan. Would definitely love doing uh, part two, going deeper into some of the topics that people find interesting. Awesome. All right. Well, until next time, peace out, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.